All right, we're going to dive into an album that I have been really, really looking forward to. And I feel like I'm a little bit more of the ambassador to pop music, to the progressive rock crowd. You know, when I started my channel, I thought I was going to be more of the progressive rock ambassador to the pop and, you know, general public. Little did I know that it's flipped and I'm more educating, you know, you guys, the the, pop, the prog lovers in the pop music style. So with that being said, let's dive into this one. Imaginal Disc by Magdalena Bay. So Magdalena Bay is a little bit of a new outfit out of California. Uh, they're a pop duo, and like I like to think of them more as like a dream pop, synth pop, art pop kind of conglomeration. You know, they're they're taking styles of say like a Grimes or Charlie XCX or Sia or even more contemporary pop artists. Like I'm getting Carly Rae Jepsen flavors on a lot of their tracks as well as Wise Blood and Spelling. Like that vibe, that very dreamlike, very ethereal, very atmospheric, synth-led pop styles of music, less singer-songwriter, more just creating vibes, you know? And their debut full-length album of Mercutial World back in 20, uh, 2021 knocked my socks off. You know, it's a shame that I didn't hear it until 2023, two years after it was released, because I would have fallen in love with it. The rich textures and soundscapes in this very accessible, very dreamlike synth wave stylings captured my interest in a way that very few bands, and especially pop bands, are able to do. Now, fronting this duo, we've got Mika Tenenbaum and Matthew Lewin, uh, both playing, you know, an assortment of instruments, programming, constructing all the songs. Uh, Mika is the one that's singing pretty much most of the tracks. You know, you'll get uh, a little bit of harmonization from Matthew every once in a while, but mainly it's Mika that's kind of the forefront of the band in terms of the singing styles, in terms of the kind of the, the front persona, but really it is a marriage between these two individuals. It's the blending of their their styles and their their presentations. So yeah, and this being their second outfit, this is kind of like a, a little bit of a, a murky water to say that this is their sophomore record because they've put out at least three mixtapes. To say that this is their sophomore record is kind of doing it a little bit of a... Uh, a disservice to the legacy of this band up to this point. But here we are with their second full-length album with Imaginal Disc. And as I mentioned, I was very, very excited for this release. I love Mercutial World. I loved all of their mixes. So I was really looking forward to a lot of like the full-length album. And I will say I was a little hesitant when I was listening to some of these singles like Image and Death and Romance. I wasn't all that excited for. You know, it was laying down a little bit of a sharper tone to their musical stylings. It was a little bit more aggressive. There was a little bit more of a punch to the mix. Uh, I think sharpness is kind of the best way for it. And I, it kind of drew me out of what I particularly loved about this you know, about their career so far is how smooth it was, how dreamlike it was. And the first thing to get you out of a dreamlike state is having some really aggressive and really sharp corners on some of these tracks. So I was a little hesitant coming into this one. But now that we get the full length album, I'm still a little bit on the fence overall how I feel about this album because it took a lot of the things that I loved with the first record and improved it vastly. But I also feel like there's moments on this album that I find quite frustrating, I find very grating, and I wish that they had done something a little bit more interesting. The first half of the album, from the first track of She Looks Like Me, all the way until about the sixth track. Now, I know that's not quite the halfway point because there's 15 tracks on here. But yeah, up to about the sixth track of Fierce Sex, I just feel as if we're kind of treading water. There's nothing wrong with these tracks. And in fact, most of these tracks are quite enjoyable overall. Like the first track of She Looked Like Me gives us the good Magdalena vibes. You know, it's very dreamlike. It almost sounds like a lullaby with some really high-end piano work or almost like one of those old wind-up toys or a music box that just has like a very high-end 
freak, uh, high end note sequence in that case. And so it's kind of lolling you into the Magdalena dreamlike fashion. Killing Time does the same thing with a really funky rhythm section on here. I love the, the bass work and the drumming on here. Again, it kind of continues on that very mellow, very soft, very ethereal presentation of music. But when we get to the True Blue interlude, which is essentially just an interlude, I'm starting to realize that these songs haven't quite grabbed me in the same way that the uh, debut album did, or you know, some of the moments from their mixtapes. And True Blue interlude is really just the spoken word a little bit of a romp about how, you know, you're the true self, you're, you know, when you let go of all of your insecurities or all of your uh, worries, you, you'll get to your true you and what that really means and how you need to continue on with that. And I just feel like because it's barely two minutes long, and even though it is more of an interlude, it's an interlude after two tracks that really didn't deserve an interlude because of their opening gates. You know, it's almost like I'm being invited into a house and I'm looking at the foyer and then the, you know, the host is like, okay, cool. I'm going to leave you for just a second. And then just pieces out and you're like, cool, but now where do I go? Then we come into Image, this one of the first singles off of this album. And it's, it's fine. You know, after a uh, true blue interlude, I was kind of waiting for something to kind of get up and go, you know, like, let's go. I'm ready because I've already heard it. It doesn't really do too much in the context of the album itself. I'm still not a huge fan of this track and I'm kind of saddened that they decided to lead this album with this track. Uh, and then it goes into death and romance, which again, I'm not the biggest fan of these two tracks and kind of having them back to back. I'm a little saddened that these were the two tracks that started this all off, especially with Fear Sex being the se uh, the sixth track, being the first track to really invite me back in. And by this point, we've already had five tracks that kind of left me a little bit cold. Uh, but at least with Fear Sex, we're feeling a little bit more of that whimsical, dreamlike synth pop that we would get from a Carly Rae Jepsen from her last handful of records. You know, there's this very accessible, much more poppy landscapes on there. It's a little bit more immediate, which I think is really needed after all those tracks that we've caught before. And honestly, it's from this track that we just get banger after banger after banger. Vampire in the Corner starts off this trend that has this infectious dance groove to it that I wasn't necessarily expecting. And the moment that I heard this track, I'm like, okay, this is the music that I'm expecting with Magdalena Bay. And this is what I want. It's a little bit more poppy. We got that dance flow on it. Again, we're getting those Carly Rae Jepsen kind of licks and stylings on there. And when we get into watching TV, ah, this is where my heart starts to melt. Like really, when I was listening to this track for the first time, I'm like, this is, this is it. This is like pop music as I love it right now. We've got this big build up, this a massive synth sound near like the end point of this track where, man, it opens up and it's so powerful. Like I get, I get this warmth inside of me when I listen to it. And I'm like, this is why I love music. What it's able to do with the soundscapes and the music, like the movements and the, the overall flavor of it is just so textured, so brilliant and so pristine. I, I, why did I have to wait until the midpoint of this album for it to really start to blossom into something beautiful? Tunnel Vision is a later single that came out and it kind of continues this trend. It, I like how they play with time signatures on this one where we go like very clearly from very fast paced, syncopated kind of a groove to a little bit more of a slow landscape, more of a driving force aspect to it. And at first I thought it was a little dry, like driven, like a little bit jarring to me. But the more I listen to it, the more I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, this is, this is good. This is where it's, we're continuing this trait. And then we continue with this like very driven bop, this very accessible pop uh, with love is everywhere. I love the grooves. I love the stylings. We're continuing the good flavors. We're continuing the good oomph within this feeling disc inserted uh, the 11th track, you know, very similar to this feeling disc inserted, uh, disconcerted or whatever. Uh, just a little quick interlude before we get to my two favorite tracks. That's My Floor, another later single that we got from this, uh, but Cry For Me. And Cry For Me and Watching TV, these two tracks really are the highlight of this album. And once again, where I thought re Watching TV was like the big high of this record, Cry For Me launched it into the stratosphere. Like that was the moment where I just, I, uh, the, the heavens opened up and the angels came down. You know, I literally start getting emotional when I listen to this track because of how emotive it is, how big it is. Like this is that symphonic dreamscape stuff, you know, like yes would be quaking in their boots to hear how massive this track is. And I was just 
puzzling why they wait why they waited so long to bring out the a games when we had to kind of slog through that first half of the record and cry for me once again brings me back into this album time and time again and i just cannot i get, like there's something about my lizard brain that absolutely adores this track and i can't get enough of it and unfortunately we have two more tracks after cry for me Angel on a Satellite, which is a little bit of an interlude track that doesn't really do too much. And then the ballad of Matt and Mika, you know, it's kind of their ode to themselves. And ah, I just, it, it goes out with a whimper rather than the big bang that was Cry For Me. And this is why I'm frustrated with this album, because on the one hand, it holds some of my absolute favorite music, hands down, of this year. Like, I have not been able to pry myself away from this record because of how engaging and how fulfilled I feel when I listen to these tracks. But on the other hand, it's quite frustrating because it's surrounded by music that I'm not all that interested in. Again, Angels on a Satellite, The Ballad of Matt and Mika, I'm not as engaged with i'm not all that excited for it doesn't really add anything new to the the album runtime or anything along those lines and then all the tracks from she looked like me all the way until about fear sex i'm not all that interested in so i'm only really interested in about like i don't know 20 to 30 minutes worth of music on a 53 minute album so yeah, it's a little it's a little frustrating. It's a little frustrating for me because I I want to I want to come back to this album, but I don't necessarily want to sit my way through it. Now that being said, we're barely a week into the album's release. You know, I recognize that I'm filming this on the, on a Wednesday after the Friday release, so we've got lots of time for these tracks to ferment, to percolate, to grow, develop, and mature. Maybe my opinions will change by the end of the year and I'll grow to really appreciate that first half of this disc. But as it sits right now, I kind of just zone out and wait for the big bangers of this track to ha hit so that I can really get into those moments. So yeah, yeah, this is this is an interesting one. This is an interesting one. And it, it makes rating this record rather difficult because there are moments on this that are full on masterpieces. You know, like as I mentioned, some of the best music I've heard all year, if not this decade. But it's also surrounded by music that is a little bit harder to get into. And not even because it's uh, challenging or it's too complex or it's uh, X, Y, Z. It's just I'm not engaged with it. You know, it doesn't grab me. So I think in the end, my final rating for this album will be Imaginal Disc by Magdalena Bay is one that I would absolutely pick up in physical format. I know that I'm going to be picking this one up in physical format. I have their first release uh, in my collection, and it would feel a disservice not to pick this one up. I do wish that they trimmed off maybe about 10 minutes off of this record to have it on a very nice, quick, and succinct single disc. I have a feeling if I pick it up in a record, it's going to be on two discs, and I'm not that excited about that. Honestly, if they shaved off about half the tracks for the first half of the album and had this album end with Cry For Me, maybe have a single track as a, a quick play out, this album would have been, at the very least, I love it with my whole heart, if not a full-on masterpiece. But... There we go. That's what I've got for Imaginal Disc from Magdalena Bay. I would still recommend checking this out, uh, especially if you're a lover of strange, quirky, or ethereal music. I think you'll really get something out of this, as I did. But yeah, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Um, what did you guys think about this record? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Whatever you thought, please let me know by commenting down below. And that's where I'm going to leave you guys today. So thank you all so much for watching. As always, you guys are definitely the best. And until next time, notes out.